for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me to talk about these um, recent results. So this is joint work with uh, Daniel Burger, my PhD supervisor, and then Paolo Faki in uh, Bari, Matthias Johnson, who's now at Pool Control, and uh, Kazuya Yuasa from Waseda University. And you can find all these results on the preprint on the archive. Um, and uh, yeah, so what to expect from this talk. So first I want to give you some uh, motivation and some like brief state of the art. This is going to be quite a big chunk of the talk because I think uh, not everyone is familiar with trotterization and why it is important. And um, also since these results are relatively mathematical, I think we need to introduce a little bit of functional analysis, I regret, but I will do everything by example and introduce everything just just everything that we need, and I don't, won't uh, go into too much maths, I hope. Um, then I will talk about state-dependent trotter error um, and introduce our um, bounds and our results there. Um, I will apply them to the hydrogen atom and show how we can um, you know, apply these to quantum chemistry problems and chemistry simulations. And um, then if I got time at the end, I want to talk a little bit about higher order product formulas, which is a kind of more clever way to do trotterization um, and also show our results in, in this room there. Um, right, so before I want to introduce to you what is the trotter product formula, I want to talk about another formula, first, which is probably one that everyone's familiar with, namely the Schrodinger equation. And um, of course, if we want to solve or find solutions to, to the Schrodinger equation, that's in general a very difficult task and sometimes it's actually even impossible. Um, and so, you know, what physicists usually do if they can't find analytical solutions, they find approximate solutions. And uh, that's, if the approximation is good, then it's good to have an approximate solution, of course. Um, and so the Trotter product formula is one way to basically do this. And uh, namely, if, if the Hamiltonian that um, we want to solve for has the form of H1 plus H2, so it basically splits into a sum, um, then we can use Trotter to find approximate solutions to the Schrödinger equation. And of course, this is the case for a very uh, uh, big class of Hamiltonians, namely all Hamiltonians, which are the form kinetic energy plus potential energy, so all Schrödinger operators. So a lot of problems can be tackled in this way. And this should already give you some idea why the Trotter product formula is such an elementary tool in, in quantum mechanics uh, in, in general. Um, and so the idea behind trotterization is the following. So basically, we can implement the time evolution under H1 very easily, and we can implement the time evolution under H2 very easily. But the sum is very difficult. It's very hard. Um, and so what we do then is we just take the total evolution time under which we um, evolve, and we split it into small pieces. And in each piece, we we, develop, uh, we evolve under H1 and then under H2, under H1, under H2. So we just alternate between H1 and H2 uh, very quickly. And um, so basically, you get this formula mathematically. So time evolution under H2, under H1, we repeat that. And that uh, converges to the actual time evolution that you want to uh, reach up to some error that um, usually is set to scale as 1 over n. Um, and so the way you can think about this maybe more geometrically, if you want, if you if you're more into into geometry, then you can think about it like this. So you you basically um, well you want to go to the supermarket, let's say, and the supermarket is at h one plus h two, but you can only go in h one direction and you can only go in h two direction, and you can't go on this straight line. There's just no no way um, in between. And so um, then if you would like to go in to uh, h h one direction first. You end up there because your space is flat. Uh, it's not flat, but it's curved basically. Um, and then, if you go to an H two direction, you end up here um, again to, due to the curvature of the space. Um, and so, of course, this is actually quite far away from where you wanted to to go. So you maybe don't end up at the supermarket, but somewhere else where you don't want to go. Um, and so, instead, if you just uh, split the time evolution into like very small pieces. Then, because each piece is so small, it doesn't see the curvature much because basically you, you're on a manifold, so your space is locally flat, um, and you end up very close to where you want it to be. So, that's kind of the geometric idea behind the Trotter product formula. So, this is basically how you can think of why, why this approach uh, works, why, why you get a good approximation of the Schrodinger equation. Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm jumping a bit ahead, but um, I was just going to ask so, you made, uh, gave this example of 
H1 and H2 being the kinetic term. Um, and like, I guess the intuition behind Connor is kind of obvious if you have a polygonal function, but it becomes a bit less obvious when you have animals going that's like in first quantization, for example. Mm -hmm. um, can you give like an intuition as to why it would be easy to implement like a potential term like one of Yes, I'm getting there. This 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 will come. Um, I, I will I, I will just explain it. I will just explain yeah, yeah. It later. It's on 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 the next slides. I think. Yes. So um, basically, um, you know, this was kind of I, I wanted to explain to you the idea behind factorization, why it worked and why it's important. But because um, it can actually solve the Schrödinger equ equation approximately, it has been uh, employed in so many different areas of physics, and this is. Just a list that I made is certainly not uh, exhaustive, but this is a lot of areas where Trotter plays a very important role. And I don't want to focus on all of them. I just want to talk about this very little part here in this talk, which is quantum computing, Hamiltonian simulation, and more particularly quantum chemistry. And I think this fits nicely into what Andrew was referring to last week, with what's like, what if we want to really build a quantum computer, then we want to simulate physics on it. And this is basically where this, this comes into, into play. Um, all right. And so um, quantum chemistry has been a um, very, uh, like has been proposed as a very fundamental application of quantum computers because potentially we might want to use it to, you know, find new pharmaceuticals, new catalysts or new fertilizers or materials in general. And um, the way we can, we can think about this is um, there's an algorithm that can implement um, can kind of implement this. And the idea is, it's called quantum phase estimation. And the idea here is we want to find the energy of some Hamiltonian um, with this, with this um, algorithm. And um, so what we have to do in this, I don't want to talk about this algorithm in detail, but I just want to point out that um, there are these controlled unitary gates in this algorithm. And the unitaries that we have to implement here is actually the, the uh, time evolution under the Hamiltonian whose energy we want to find. So if we want to do quantum chemistry and we want to find, the, the, for instance, the ground state energy of some Hamiltonian, we have to implement the dynamics of this Hamiltonian. But because implementing the dynamics of a Hamiltonian is the same problem as solving uh, the energies for this Hamiltonian, we can't just do it because otherwise this, this whole algorithm would be kind of useless. We, we would already know the energies. So that's why we need, we need some approximate way to get the time evolution. And that's where people usually use the Trotter product formula. In, in quantum chemistry simulations. And this in these unitaries are basically um, Trotter unitaries. Um, okay. And so now I'm I'm gonna refer to your question. This is basically this slide is basically um and, and to explain your question. So what if we talk about if we have some Hamiltonian of the form kinetic plus potential energy? So here I call H1 the kinetic energy and H2 the potential energy. And so then in quantum phase estimation, we start with something with a state that's um, a guess for the ground state. And th this I call phi here. Um, and the ground state um, has energy H. I just pr pr uh, pretend now I know everything about my system. Um, and so what I want to implement then is the dynamics under the full Hamiltonian applied to, to that uh, ground state, for instance. And this, because this is a, an eigenstate of H1 plus H2 by assumption, the, this time evolution just um, computes to a phase on the state, right? Because it's an eigenstate, right? So that's what, what we want to do in, in quantum phase estimation. We want to find the space. Um, and so usually we can't just, you know, write on the gate decomposition for this, for this target evolution. This is very difficult. We can't just implement this on the quantum computer. And that's why we use um, uh, trotterization to do that. Um, and now uh, back to your question. So um, so the potential energy basically just multiplies the wave function by uh, v of x, right? It's it's kind of already diagonal in in the basis that you're looking that you're looking at. If you if you uh, think about it as a matrix, then it will just uh, you know multiply each wave function by by its argument. For instance, if it's x, if the potential energy would be x. So this is easy to implement. We know how to do that. Um, it's it's just a diagonal matrix. You you know how to take exponential of, of a diagonal matrix basically. But the, the kinetic energy is, is still hard. So, and we still don't know the, the gate decomposition of this. Um, and, but the good thing is we know how to diagonalize it, namely with a Fourier transform. So we can just insert Fourier transform here, convert everything into, into momentum space, 
then the um, kinetic energy will become diagonal. We can compute the matrix exponential easily here. And then we just co uh, convert back into position space where the potential energy is diagonal and we can compute uh, everything very easily there. So this is a, a very um, easy algorithm um, to, to um, you know, compute trot up when, when you have something of the form kinetic plus potential energy. And because we know how the um, quantum Fourier transform is decomposed into gates efficiently, we can implement this algorithm efficiently. That's basically um, how, how you can do it in practice. Okay, um, and so, right, I promised you I want to talk a little bit about the hydrogen atom. So this is an example of, of such a system. So of course it's a toy example, but it's a very paradigmatic example because it's kind of the first system where the Schrodinger equation has been solved for. Everything's analytically known about it, so we can uh, you know, apply the results directly and also um, it forms the basis for our understanding of more complicated atoms and molecules. So it's a good model to start with. Yes. Uh, sorry. Um, can you explain what the what the complexity for explaining the potential would be? Uh, so not clearly why we really use it you can easily implement it good style. Yes. But that's the some Cost to that. It's not clearly what that actually is. Well, I, I, you know, actually efficient right now. I think if you want to do that um, as a matrix, if you want to represent it as a matrix, you first have to truncate mm -hmm. and uh, you know choose some like reasonably large um, truncation basis, and then depending on on your uh, on the truncation dimension that you choose, you get a different gate decomposition, of course, and. The larger you choose the truncation dimension, the more, comp more the more gates you will uh, probably need. Um, but uh, I will also kind of go into that later as well. Okay. Um, uh, not directly, but it will be. Uh, uh, let's talk about it later. I, I can. I can. I think there's a lot more to say about this. But in general, if I'm implementing a diagonal matrix, yeah. I can do that. In I mean, it, I mean, I have to think about how binary expansion works, but it's constant depth for sure. It's not like single pure gates, right? Oh, because you can just do it in like R0 things. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's things like that. Just, just imagine that you're representing your real number in yeah. some binary location, and I just want to apply, um, uh, it, you know, I've got a matrix, yeah, I've got a matrix of those. If I just need, yeah, some constant depth thing. Yeah. That I think, right. Yes. Okay. So now, if I were to implement the hydrogen atom with this procedure that I just tried to explain to you, then of course, what we want is basically we want to know how big do we have to make this this trotter number, like how many trotter steps do I need, or um, equivalently, how small do my individual steps have to be. Um, and so, um, of course, if I make this this larger, this n larger, then I make my steps smaller, so my simulation accuracy is better, which is great. But on the other hand, um, the the more uh, trotter steps I have to implement, the because each time evolution I have to decompose into gates again, the more resources I need, right? Because each of these trotter steps I have to, you know, give, it gives me more gates. And also the larger the runtime of my algorithm is, and that's a problem on this machines because there we suffer from noise and also from gate imperfections. And um, so that's kind of some trade-off. Um, we we want to make n large to get good simulation accuracy, but we don't want to make it large enough because otherwise the, the the noise will be too big and the resources will be too big. And so that's why it's really important that we know how to implement this efficiently and how to approximate, like how to basically quantify how uh, how big the trotter error is, so that we know how many uh, how big we have to make this this trotter uh, trotter number. Um, and so here's what people usually do. This is this is the state of the art how people quantify the the trotter error to compute how big they they have to make this n. And so basically the idea is they just take the difference between the trotter evolution and the target evolution in some norm, which is the operator norm. So the operator norm is defined like this, is the supremum over all normalized states when I apply the operator to states. And it's basically, if you have matrices, it's just the largest singular value of that matrix. It's, it's nothing very scary. It's, you can compute it if you want. And so um, the, the bounds people use for this um, are these and they are they are kind of nice because they have this commutator scaling so um, they depend on the commutator of, a, uh, of, of h1 and h2 and that's 
that's neat because if H1 and H2 commute, then we don't need trotter. We, it, everything is just exact and this bound will compute to zero. So in that sense, this bound is tight. Um, and the scaling of these bounds is, is, is at one over N, as we would expect from, from uh, basically, um, if we tailor expand the, the target evolution and we tailor expand the, the trotter evolution, I don't want to go into detail, but if you subtract these two, you actually up to first order, you get exactly this commutator term and the scales is one over N. So that's why these bounds are, are kind of neat and, and kind of what, what people like. Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, I see you saw a site of maybe 20 of me, but what sort of bounds are there in correlation that make us like see the pictures? Yes, the same bounds. Yes. From and they all the, correct yes. Yes, 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 yes. And, and I, was, I never understood that. Too. What improvement actually? Is that in the 2021? Ah, so that one is for they, they do all this for higher order trotterization as well, and oh. they managed to um reduce the prefactors uh, oh. quite a bit for the higher order product okay. formulas. But for first order, they get the same result as Suzuki. Yes. Okay, so basically that's that's the state of the art, that's what people are doing. Um so Let's just look at the hydrogen atom. Let's just plug it in uh, in into the bounds that people are using. So, um, so of course we can do that. We can compute the commutator of H one and H two, and this is proportional to like to to this operator here. And then we can take the operator norm of this. But the thing is that this operator here is an undounded operator. So if you compute this, you basically get infinity, which is bad, right? So these bounds will tell you the trotter error is smaller than infinity. Great, right? It's like kind of pointless. Um, I mean, I knew this before as well. The maximum the operator norm can achieve is the number two. So um, <laughs> this kind of um, like the, this difference can be like two maximum. So it's, these bounds are kind of pointless, and they they also don't this doesn't depend on n anymore, right? Because the larger I make n, it doesn't matter because infinity times one over one million is still infinity. So Right. This is this is this is not so great, and um, so the question is: in this case, does Trotter even converge? Can we even say that that this dynamics approaches that dynamics in the, in the Trotter limit? Um, and uh, so before I I, I talk about um, you know whether Trotter converges, I have to tell you in which sense I, I mean uh, convergence even in the first place. And there are different notions of convergence, and this is some kind of this is probably like analysis one, I guess. I, I hope it's not. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think probably nobody remembers because it's so long ago that we learned all this. So I just want to uh, go a little bit into it again and, and refresh it. So if you think about the sequence of functions at n that goes from some space x to the real numbers and another function f, which is kind of thought as, as the limit of this sequence of functions. Um, then there's the notion of pointwise convergence, which basically means that if we just plug in numbers from x, then in the limit, we get the same number as f, f of x for all points in x. So that basically means that, that the, the sequence of functions converges to, to the function f, um, but each point could in principle have their own convergence speed. So some some uh, uh, you know for some x I get slower convergence, for some x I get um, faster convergence, but at the end, I still end up at, at f of x, okay? And in, a very simple example would be this one over n times x squared, and of course, if I um, like, if I make x large, then it converges slower than if I make x small, right? But it will still go to zero, no matter what x is, basically. Um, and then there's the notion of uniform convergence, which is uh, kind of quantified by something similar than the operator norm, if you think about it, right? It's like, I plug in all, all inputs and into the function, uh, into the sequence and into the limit and say that, that this should, should become small, the difference of this one. And what this basically means intuitively is that I have convergence and, and there's an overall convergence speed. So for each point X that I insert here, I get the same convergence speed. Every, um, every point gives me the, the same uh, convergence. And so these are the kind of two, um, two notions of convergence that I want you to think of. Um, and of course, in, in, uh, if we think about Trotter now, then we don't have functions anymore, but we have operators, and these act on a Hilbert space, so they don't eat points in, in this space X anymore, but they eat vectors in, in, in the Hilbert space. And so I have a like a, a sequence, um, which is given by the Trotter product, and the, the target, which is given by my target dynamics. And um, 
here the the pointwise convergence would mean convergence on states, right? It's because these operators each each states. So that means that for all states, the difference goes goes to zero. Um, but then states can have different convergence speed. Um, and uniform convergence would be convergence in the operator norm, right? It's just the difference uh, between the, the two in, in some norm and each state, that would mean each state has the same convergence speed. Um, and so to give you an example, um, so these bounds that, that are shown from, by Suzuki and also by Childs and, and others um, that I showed you before, um, these are basically four matrices. They hold true for all matrices. So um, that means that because this one here goes to zero as n goes to infinity, that Trapper converges uniformly for all matrices. Um, but, but for operators, uh, that's not the case anymore. And um, so to give you an example, I just look at this, this simple system here where h1 is x squared and h2 is p, which is basically by Curie transform equivalent to a particle and gravitational potential. Um, then uh, it has been shown by Ikinoso that he, he could actually compute the Trotter error analytically for this example. And in operator norm, this is two. So that's the maximum, the this distance between the two evolutions. So Trotter doesn't converge uniformly. It doesn't, just doesn't converge in norm for, for this example. Um, but that means that R, the data is actually evaluated precisely. Yes, yes, and that's true. For this particular example, because I would have thought in, in some sense that the error could actually be infinite, but in this particular case, it's some non matrix example that the error is. I mean, the error is constant and large, but it's not infinite. The error will never be infinite if you compute it exactly, because you can just do a triangle inequality here. So this so, is all equal to, to the norm of this. Let's see, you the norm of this. And so the, the maximum the operator norm can attain is two. two. Yes. Okay, so this is maximum. Yeah, there. that's right. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, so for this example, still Trotter converges for all states. So we do have pointwise convergence. And um, the but the rate of the convergence can be arbitrarily slow. And the way you can see this is by look at the, looking at the wave function like this. So this is parameterized by some number else. Um, and so, so if if L is one plus epsilon, then um, we can actually compute the Trotter error analytically for this as well, and it converges as n to the epsilon half. So if epsilon goes to zero, this doesn't converge anymore. But uh, epsilon goes to zero, this is not a wave function anymore. Um, this is not a Hilbert space element anymore. But but basically, for any epsilon larger than zero, it is, and then the the convergence rate is arbitrarily small for this example. Okay, so the, the punchline here is Trotter converges uniformly for matrices, but for operators on um, infinite dimensional Hilbert space, it only converges pointwise. And uh, so, of course, if we want to talk about these operators, then we can't talk about the norm error anymore. But what we have to do if we have pointwise convergence is the state dependent error, which is given by this quantity. So I look at the Trotter evolution applied to some state minus the target evolution applied to some state. And that's the quantity that I really have to look at if I want to talk about operators. Um, and so in quantum chemistry, since we want to look at the spectral properties of our target operator, we want to look at eigenstates of, of the target operator and want to see how, how well Trotter converges in eigenstates. And um, before I give you our um, results, I want to give you some quick interlude on something that's called domains. It's kind of like some little function analysis interlude that I um, that I talked about in the beginning. So if we talk about the position operator that I'm sure everyone knows, it basically just multiplies a wave function by its argument. Um, it's an operator on L2 of R, which is an un uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, then, uh, so there's a condition, right, for the position operator to be well defined, namely that the result of the application of the position operator is again, a wave function, it has to be square integrable, it has to be normalizable, basically. Um, so this gives some condition on the on the states on which the position operator can act, namely only the states where the result is again square integrable, right? right? Right. So that's basically a condition. And so this is a strict subset of the whole Hilbert space. So the position operator cannot act on all wave functions. It can only act on the wave functions that are in this domain. Otherwise, it will take us out of the Hilbert space. Um, and so here's an example of a wave function where um, the application of x to this wave function is, in, uh, is not 
uh, normalizable again. So this is an example of a wave function where, which is not in the domain of X, right? So here, that's how you can see that it's actually a strict subset. You just construct simple examples. You can do the same story with the momentum operator as well, which acts as a derivative, basically. So again, the derivative has to be in the in the Hilbert space for it to be well-defined. And so you have this kind of condition that, that again, the, the derivative has to be in the Hilbert space, otherwise uh, it's the, the state is not in the domain. Oh, and by the way, it has to be differentiable in the first place, right? Because if the function is not differentiable, then we can't uh, build the derivative. And this is an example of a non-differentiable function that's still L2 of R, it's just a square, but we can't build, form the derivative here. So this one is not in the domain of the momentum of the so we can't act with the momentum of the problem. So this is kind of the idea of domains, basically. And now I'm actually ready to tell you what, what we what we did in our um, in our paper. So we actually derived these state-dependent trotter bounds. And um, so for this, if we have two self event operators, two Hamiltonians, um, and so we have a state phi that's in the domain of h1 squared and of h2 squared. So that's why I had to introduce domains to you, so you understand this condition. Um, and so this state is supposed to be an eigenstate of the target evolution with eigenvalue h, because that's what we want in quantum chemistry. Then we actually can find these bounds here for Trotter on applied to input states. And um, so you can see why we need these domain conditions, because we have to act with h1 on phi, uh, h1 squared on phi, and with h2 squared on phi. And also what's neat about these bounds is that we get the same scaling uh, as in the, in the um, norm case. So they scale as t squared over n, basically, which is kind of nice. So now we can actually really look at these unbound operators, like the hydrogen atom, where we previously got infinity as, as our answer. And uh, if I look at eigenfunctions of the hydrogen atom, I will always parameterize them by the principal quantum number and the, the orbital angular momentum quantum numbers, L and M. Um, and so I also wrote down the, the eigenenergies of the hydrogen atom. And if we just plug in the um, into our bounds the state, for instance, the three to zero state, some d orbital, basically, then we get these really simple looking and nice bounds, and we actually can quantify the tropper around for these for these states. Um, and we also did some numerics, and it matches. We get some like one over n scaling. All is nice and fine. Okay, so now this is something that has hasn't been possible before, really, like because the the previous bounds basically just trivialized. Um, and now. People usually in quantum chemistry want to look at the ground state, right? Then they, that's a very important quantity that, that people are interested in. And so now if we want to plug in uh, the ground state into our bounds, we have to act with H1 squared on the ground state and with H2 squared on the ground state. But the problem is the ground state is not in the domain of those. So we can't do that. And so that means that our bounds will become infinity as well. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it's kind of, kind of, uh, uh, kind of scary and kind of uh, surprising as well, because uh, you would expect that for the ground set, everything's kind of fine and well-defined, but actually not, it, it's not. But um, luckily you can do some more refined analysis. We, we find some bounds which, where, which, where you just have like the action of H1 and H2 on, on the ground set or on phi, and this is actually well-defined. And so if we, if we compute this, we get some very horrible looking bounds but the main thing uh, I want to point out about these bounds is that they have a slower scaling. They don't scale as one over n anymore. They scale as one over n to the one fourth. And that's what I like try to convince you with the pointwise convergence that you ha have always have these states with in any uh, trotter product of unbounded operators. Um, and of course, these are just bounds, right? These are not like I I, I didn't uh, claim that we proved that this is the actually the, the correct. Um, the correct uh, quantity, but we have some numerics as well to, to, to undermine this. I'll show you on the next slide. Um, but in fact, what is interesting is that the whole scaling of the Trotter error is just determined by the L quantum number. So for all S orbitals, we get the slower scaling. For all P orbitals, we also get some a little bit slower scaling. And all D orbitals and higher are fine. They give us the one over N scaling that we want and that we expected, basically. Um, and here's the numerics I, I promised you. So um, basically, um, the problem with this, if you want to do it numerically, is that you, you still have to truncate your operator at some finite level to simulate it numerically. But this effect is 
only only holds for unbounded operators. So the question is, how can you see this effect in of unbounded of unboundedness in digital simulations? And the way we did it is like this. So we truncate at some truncation dimension here, like 100, 200, 300, 400, 800. And we see that there's a slower scaling first, and then there's some transition region, and then we have the one over n scaling from the finite size effect from the truncation, basically. Um, but then the this transition to the one over n happens later and later and later, the higher we go with our truncation, which means ultimately in the limit of in the full limit of infinite dimensions, we will never have this transition. And then um, we also extrapolated the slower scaling, and we get exactly the one over n to the one for scaling that we um that we get from our bounds so it seems like the scaling is is actually is actually uh tied to this yes so is this is implying that uh, the truncation is not so basically that we can't truncate the region um yeah that's a very difficult question i think um uh I think there's a there's a lot to say about this. I don't think I have time to. I will say a bit about truncation as well in the next slides. But let's talk about this afterwards because otherwise I don't think I'll have time to go through everything. <laughs> yes. So I would have thought that um. So when the system gets large, uh, sorry. What I mean is when, when that transition happens from the scaling you expect of the infinite number of modes to some scaling you expect for a matrix, this is is this an error between the trotterized evolution and the exact evolution on that side of the matrix? Or is it a, an error between the trotterized evolution and the actual evolution of the infinite dimensional system? I mean, I suppose what I'm what I'm envisaging is that actually the point where this transition occurs is the point where actually the errors are dominated by the truncation yes, error that's right. and not by yeah. the true model. Yeah. So you know, you could take the view that you know, this if in terms of doing numerics for the system of interest, you are seeing this in sort of one order scaling. Yes. And then this thing about dropping off at finite size is it is occurring because. You've, you've put yourself yes. in Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So, so that behavior at the bottom is sort of saying how, you know, it's first order try to error at a fixed number of modes, try error between the evolution and. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Are you going to say something? Are you going to say something at some point uh, about? Relationship to the bound that you have and the commutator yeah. bound, uh, or or should I ask you a question? Later? You can ask question. <laughs> so because it seems like the bound looks like it's the norm. It's a it's a norm of a vector that's like h one squared on the state plus h two squared mm -hmm. minus n on the state. And I suppose I have two questions about that. One is why the asymmetry between h one and h two, and the other one is. Is there some way I can see how that's related to just the operating model? Um, so uh, the asymmetry is kind of um, arbitrary. So you can shift. I, I haven't showed this on these bounds because it looks more complicated. But you can shift the energy arbitrarily um, between the two um, between right. the two operating because... um, Yeah, exactly. So you could, in principle, introduce some parameter g there as well and take the infimum over all g and then. Like the one that gives you the tightest, yes, that's right. So you this asymmetry you don't necessarily um, have to have it. Um, yes. And so um the question about the commutator bound is a very interesting question because we also proved um that you cannot expect to have uh, state dependent bounds with the commutator scaling. Um because the essentially the commutator applied to state doesn't contain um, all the information that you need. For the trotter error, you can have cases where trotter doesn't uh, trotter isn't exact, so trotter still gives you an error, but the commutator applied to some input state is zero, because the the um, input state is a zero eigenstate of the commutator. These examples exist uh, even finite dimensionally, um, and uh, in infinite dimensions, you can even have cases where um, you get zero, uh, the commutator applied to the state is zero on a dense uh, subspace of the whole Hilbert space. Um, and yeah. Trotter doesn't even converge for these examples, like not at all, not even on states. And so you cannot really hope that you get commutator 
uh, scaling for, for input state dependent bounds. Uh, I think there have, has been a paper, I think last week or the week before last week on the archive where they do um, commutator scaling for low energy states. And that apparently seems to work. Um, but yeah, I haven't looked into the details of this too much yet. The other one was you specified that the state was an eigenstate of H at the beginning. Yes. I suppose we saw that again that gives you different behaviors depending on the eigenstate. But is it is that required? Could I come up with a bound like this where I made the, the assumption about some assumption of the state of interest is in some domain and uh bounds the trial error of the time evolution even not evolving in eigenstates? Yes, so you can use if you can do that also with these bounds, then you just use try like you just express the state in the basis of eigenstates and use try and inequality to use our bounds. Of course, the, the this only works for states where um the sum, because when I do trying inequality, I have to take out all the coefficients, absolute yeah. value. And so the state has to be L2 and L1. And so that's a stronger condition. But of course, if it's a finite um Linear combination, then all our bounds always work. Um, yeah, that could be quite an efficient. Yes, maybe. that's right. You get a big overhead. Big 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 yes, yes that, that's true. That's true. But if you look at these bounds, like for you can see, like numerically, this is what we get, and this is these are our bounds. So this also seems to be not super tight if you look at the prefect. So okay. there might it might be possible to to make these bounds much tighter still. But what we what we actually wanted to do is first find some state dependent bounds because they're just not available in the literature yet and look at what happens if we apply them to right. to um to systems yeah actually okay so what i'm interrogating you guys have is the context in the literature at the moment is that there were not bounds of this type there were yes. sort of known counter examples to <coughs> the client initial behavior but there wasn't any kind of state dependent replacement yes, yes. that's right yes so that was the idea of this of this project, basically, to find these bounds first. Because, I mean, this kind of simulation is very widely used. Yes. Right. Yes. It's called split step method or split operator. Or split operator. operator. Frank Nicholson, I think, is almost the same. Yeah. It's, it's, it's got actually a wide variety. Of yes. Strong splitting as well. Tom yeah. Tom's story. Yeah. It's, yeah. Like, it's, it's like, yeah. Yeah. it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 Right, so basically now I, I just told you that the scaling is slower, but we also want to understand physically why this actually happens, not only mathematically. And so the reason is the following. So um, you can think about the S orbitals, they're like balls, right? So um, they have a large electron uh, uh, density close to the nucleus, which is where the one over R singularity of the Coulomb potential sits. But in the Trotter evolution, you evolve under the bare Coulomb um, potential um, and so something bad happens with this evolution and what actually happens is that this evolution kicks out some uh, probability of the electron density to the space of of free states so it ionizes the hydrogen atom partially and we can actually see this numerically as well so this is the ionization fraction for the f orbitals and it's much higher than the ionization fraction for the d orbitals um, so ionization seems to be the physical effect that's responsible for, for the slower scaling because of course, if the evolution ionizes uh, the the state, it's a bad approximation of the target evolution, which preserves the, the space of bound states. Does that suggest that if you had a potential that only had a bound spectrum, that the situation might be better? Yeah, could be. Yes, could be. Yeah. The, the problem is, of course, the kinetic energy is also an unbounded operator. And in some sense, it's even more unbounded than the potential energy. It's, but um, but then of course if you have the a bounded potential the eigenstates which all would also look very different and I would expect that you might you might be lucky there more lucky also for molecules you, you might be more lucky because you, the ground state has electron density between the between the two nuclei and isn't isn't close to the singularities so it could be that things don't go wrong there but I don't know I think nobody knows it's it's not it's not not really it's an open research question basically. Um, and yeah, because this topic came up already quite a bit, um, I want to talk about truncation a little bit, like, because, of course, usually if we do digital simulation, we work on some truncated model. And there's this um, this quote I, from, from an archive paper where they said, provided that an appropriate cutoff is picked for the system, the discrepancies between the truncated and untruncated systems will often be negligible. 
And this is simply incorrect. <laughs> um, and so uh, you can see this, for instance, like there's this paper that we wrote uh, last year um, where we actually studied this truncation um, phenomenon. And th this is an example of a system where you just cauterize between the harmonic oscillator and the generator of the squeezing transformation. And uh, for some uh, fixed number of proper steps, you compute the dropper error and just increase the truncation dimension. And you see that very quickly it approaches two, which is the maximum error you can get. So in this case, tr truncation will be the dominant source of error, basically. Um, what are these splits where it comes back down? This one? Yeah. And it's like several more. Yeah. So this usually ha always happens if you uh, if you approach two that it kind of wobbles around two and then it approaches two. I, I, I don't, th there's some, I think there's some literature on this as well. It's like chaotic behavior of, of polarization. People, people study this as well, but I'm, I'm not an expert. So. What is the dimension of truncation? So it's more truncation as you move to the right. So yes. Okay. So in this case, I just truncated in the fox basis and I've okay. taken more fox phase. So, so it's 150, meaning what does that mean? You truncate at 150 or 150 fox phase? Okay. It's a 150 times right. 150 matrix and a plot between these. Yeah. Okay. What is that? <laughs> this is the norm norm. So, operator norm, but yes. you can't compare finite dimensional operator with like that. So I just compute the operator norm error between the proper this proper evolution and the target evolution. And of course, because Trotter doesn't converge in operator norm, this is kind of not this is kind of expected that something like this will happen. Sorry, um, I somehow you had a measure of error from truncation. Oh sorry, I misread it. Truncation and trotter. Okay. Is there a measure of just how much error comes from truncation? Um, yes, I think you can kind of think about it like this. Um, it comes on the next slide. <laughs> okay. um, so the question is, can we choose the cutoff independently of the number of total steps? And this is basically goes in exactly into your question. So uh, to introduce how you can actually think about this is you first pick a beta for your Hilbert space, then you build a projector PD that projects onto some d-dimensional subspace of the Hilbert space by just picking the first d basis vectors. And then you can build the truncated matrices by just projecting them down onto the subspace. Um, and so if you now want to look at the Trotter error, um, the actual Trotter error of the full infinite dimensional system, you can insert a zero and do triangle inequality. And what you get is you get an error that's kind of the truncation error, the difference between the actual target evolution and the truncated target evolution. You get um, some matrix for the error, the difference between the truncated trotter evolution and the truncated target evolution, and you get some uh, the the trotter product truncation error. So the difference between the truncated trotter evolution and the, the actual trotter evolution. Um, and so um, basically, this is this is what you get. And so this first part here is just some truncation error that's independent of the number of trotter steps. Um, this error here, um, basically, we can we can use these these uh, these commutator bounds to see that they this scales as d squared over n with the truncation dimension, and this one here, um, I don't really know how it scales, but it also depends on the n on n, right? So so basically, these two terms cause cause trouble. So these two terms tell you that that uh, we can't really choose. It independently of each other. And now to your question, I think it's a bit difficult to disentangle it because, um, because as I said, these two terms depend on both quantities. So um, yeah, this one, of course, is only truncation error, but these ones here also have some truncation error inside and it's very hard to disentangle it. Um, yes. Um, okay, so I don't know if I still get time to talk about higher order tautorization. I don't think Really, I have I have five minutes. Ten minutes. minutes, okay. Um, okay. So, well, higher order trotterization is basically some more clever way to do trotterization. So you symmetrize the the time evolution. Here you have like <coughs> half h one h two half h one, and that scales half, so that goes as one over n squared instead of only one over n. You could do it the opposite way as well for second order. So you could start with h two and then do h one, then do h two again, and um, and you can you can play this game more and more and you, this is like the fourth order product formula which scales as one over n to the one fourth it looks horrible i don't want to 
make you read it. And you can even go further and you can um, like you can define heath order for like probably basically that scales as one over n to the p. Um, and so of course for these bounds we have the same problem that the uh, for these product formulas we have the same problem that the norm bounds in the literature trivialize. Um, and so this is for second order here um, that, that I looked at. And so of course we have to make a state dependent again. Um, and so if we if we now look at the p equals to two case, we also we provide bounds basically for all p. We can do we can do arbitrary uh, heath order product formula state dependent. And these these are our bounds for for second order properization. And you can see here that we have h one cubed on phi, some mixed term, and also h two cubed on phi. And so these basically the domain conditions that I get now on phi are even stronger than before because the phi is not in the domain of h one squared, so I can't act with h one twice on it. I of course can't act on it three times as uh, right. So I get even stronger domain conditions for for second order virtualization. And um, so we find also we find here we, we we can find like more refined bounds and we can compute actual bounds for the second order Trotter error as well. For, and for the ground state, these again scale as one over n to the one fourth, exactly as the first order Trotter bounds. And we see this numerically as well. Um, this this behavior. Um, and also for second order, we we get that it only depends on the on the L quantum number. It's a, it's a bit longer than this here because you have states which kind of scale. Uh, faster than one over n, but still slower than one over n squared, and you have all these kind of intermediate regimes as well. Um, and what we find quite interesting is that there seems to be an asymmetry in the scaling. So for for the f of uh, for the f orbitals, we get like different scalings um, depending on whether we do h two h one h two or h one h two h one, like which one of the which one of the two second order product formulas. But we don't see this numerically. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's probably just an artifact of our proof method. Um, but it's interesting still, I think. So I wanted to, to bring it up. Um, and so we do get the same effect for fourth order trotter as well. We also get slower scaling for fourth order uh, trotter. And it seems like that no matter how, how, how you go in the trotter ladder, you will always get this slower scaling if first order trotter already scales this slow. Um, and this is the numerics for fourth order trotter. So we see it numerically as well. Um, and so ultimately, if we think about this, what this means in practice is for these states where we see the slower trotter convergence, we don't want to use higher order product formulas because they involve much more unitaries. So they are much harder to implement, but they don't give us any advantage. So for these states, we actually want to use first or second order trotter because second order is kind of the same as first order, just with two boundary terms. But yeah, so basically we just want to use a lower order for these for these states. Um, right. And basically, I think that's 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 it to summarize. So what we do is we provide these general state dependent bounds. So with this, we can now compute trotter error analytically, um, which was not possible before. Um, and then also these for certain states, this the trotter errors get slower than what people usually claim. So in practice, that means that it might take a bit longer before quantum computers can implement these quantum chemistry tasks. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, that's kind of a negative message, but um, yeah. at least it's kind of a rigorous message, I, I would say. And uh, so then also the, the whole higher order total hierarchy breaks down for, for these states, which have a slower scaling, and which means that we want to use first order factorization for, for these states. Um, and yes, I think with this, I would like to thank you and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Can you share some different decomposition of the total Hamiltonian to like get around the restrictions from the domain? Well, you can always choose uh, decomposition as target Hamiltonian over two and target Hamiltonian over two, right? And then you don't even need to do trotter. So it's it's kind of like of course it's a it's a good question of what's the best decomposition but it's also kind of a tricky question to to answer because because of this um the reason why people use this potential and kinetic energy decomposition is because they know exactly how to implement the dynamics under potential energy and they know exactly how to implement dynamics under uh, kinetic energy so you would have to find some decomposition that you know how to implement and um, and then you you might be more lucky, yes, but um, in, if that's possible in practice, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I have a question. I'm sorry, I still couldn't wrap my head around the third term in that 
there was a truncation error, there was a clot error, and there was a mixed error. Yes, 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 yes. I can go back to that if you want. This one. Yeah, thank yes. you. Yeah. The first one is just, yeah. Yeah, so I basically just inserted this term and this term. So, well, plus this term minus this term, and I inserted plus this term minus this term. Then usually, like, usually when we do, when we want to do A to C, we do A minus B and then B minus C. But the third term looks somewhat like A minus C, which I have not seen before. Ah, uh, because you can, uh, well, I mean, you can put the minus sign, the minus sign gets absorbed by the norm, basically. Uh, I <laughs> well, it's absorbed this minus sign. Look, this this has a minus. This one here, yeah. minus minus e, right. and this one this one has a plus then, and I just absorbed it into the norm. Okay. So there would be a plus here, and this term would cancel this term with a minus here. Okay. Is that the? I mean, so that's a bound on the. <coughs> The product error implemented in that infinite dimensional space to the uh, to the true evolution of mm -hmm. in the infinite dimensional space, uh, and that if, and if I understand that's why you've got sort of more terms on the right hand side than you might guess. You, you could ask for the error between the. It, it, I'm just wondering, is that the thing I care about, or do I care about? The error between the true evolution implemented on the infinite dimension of space and the finite dimension of product product. Mm. I see. Is that what I not what I care about? Is the thing I've done on my computer is a finite dimensional product product, yeah. and the thing I want yeah. is the infinite dimensional yeah. thing. The error between those two would have yeah. two terms, but not wrong. It would have like the it would have <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, I know, I know. It's but it would have only two terms on yes, the yes, 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 yes. Um, um, it wouldn't change your argument because, by understanding correctly, it would have a term that depends on both. Yes. Uh, truncation and and trotter's size. So I feel like that's what I care. What I care about is I don't see my computer. Yes. And if I want to know what is the error so the you know true out there in the world, yes. the actual yes. information model. So you want to take the difference between. Um, between this term yeah. and that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's what I'm more interested in. So I, I don't think I'm, I'm not pragmatically speaking very interested in the mm -hmm. yes. of uh, uh, numerical method actions, mm -hmm. and, which is uh, that. Yeah. Right, right. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, um, yes, you, probably you could look at this quantity as well, but I think probably would be an interesting quantity to look at. Mm -hmm. The question is always how to compute it, right? I mean, this is also not terribly easy to compute. I think this you can compute uh, in, in simple models. You can compute this, and you can always compute this. But this one is is also really difficult to compute. So maybe the quantity you yeah, that's what I'm thinking is that one yeah. does not appear. Yes, that yes. one does not appear in the thing that I am doing. Right. So that could be it could be a, an interesting um, interesting quantity to look at as well. Yes, yes, or better than me. Also, let's thank 